Hi gang, so I want to talk to you guys today about leadership and management skills. I know this is a little different and I know that throughout your academic career so far you have not had a leadership and management training course so this is one of the things I'm going to implement into the course here. I worked for years as a state manager in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and I saw such problems because of poor leadership and poor management skills. This is why I'm introducing into the course here one of the most paramount things you need to learn is how do you work with others? How do you build a team? How do you become a leader? And how do you create value added? Value added is not just to the company or organization or adding a new line of code. We're all into innovation and technology, but we forget that we got to work with people. I'm going to talk to you today about the different levels of interpersonal skills in cultures, in groups and communities of practice. And I'm going to talk to you about how we have to overcome a lot of things in our lives, especially in this course, that are going to be real world. One of the books I read years ago and I love is uh, Tribal Leadership. It talks about natural groups and communities and how these natural groups and communities form implicit and explicit organizations that help each other. The best in the world are the ones that learn it's not just us, it's not about our product, it's about empowering others. Think about that a second. What comes to mind first? To me, Apple. Apple was started on this premises of, yes, we need a product, but it was from a vision of, we can make it so everybody has this accessible piece of machinery and empower everyone. Bill Gates was under this same thing. We'll talk about this value-added premises. What are natural groups? What are they? Well, if you think about it, natural groups have been studied for years. Anthropologists had started out looking at tribes in, such as the Yanomamo tribe. They looked at how these groupings of these people survived in these very, very, very rich environments of strife, internal warfare, and dangerous animals, poor water. They looked at how leadership came out of them from left to right to up to down and who becomes a leader and why in these natural groupings. If you think about it, we have them here. In Macon, there was what? Burial mounds from Indians. So we know that there was Indians here. In Pennsylvania, where I lived, I know there was. It was very interesting because there was forts built around me because of plentiful water and fish. The community area was great. But those communities survived of Indians because of leadership and organization practices. And we're going to talk a lot about them throughout this semester. So let's get into it. The first thing you need to think about is your language. Yes, your language. And I'm not talking about profanity. I'm talking about how you communicate with others and how your group is going to communicate with each other. Are we we versus I? Yes, it sounds weird, and we're going to work through this. You have to think about what is our outcome? What is our vision? What is our deadline? And is our leadership measuring up to those potentials we need? And eventually, having value added. Am I adding value to this group? What is my value added? Throughout the course of the semester, I'm going to have you do SWOT analysis. That means strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What are your strengths right now? You have a lot of educational background. Maybe you're weak in coding. Maybe your opportunities are, well, I'm taking this course, and I know that Professor Spangler right now is teaching me some leadership skills. How do I be effective? How can I influence others? How can I make a community of practice in my school today? Can I be a mentor for a freshman student? And put that on my resume. Organizations love this. It's not just about you. It's about them and even greater them, society. This is how you get jobs. 
when you can empower others, when you can empower not only your organization, your community of practice to do your tasks and goals, but you move that uh, past you. And you get into this language of empowerment, externalization. And we're going to talk about measures on how to do this. Tribal values. Yes, we have to come up with outcomes, our assets and our values. We're going to do those in our reports. We're going to use paradigms. We're going to talk about methodologies, our user task analysis to make sure we're on track for our outcomes. We're going to talk about the assets by talking to our clients. Are we getting what they want? Is this a value for us and for them? Is it a win-win situation? This mental cognitive representation starts thinking about behaviors. It creates a way to say, we have once, we have to do something, and we're doing something. Are they all in line? Is our community of practice, our group, our tribe, if you want to call them, our gang, working together as a community? Or do we have problems? And if we have problems, how do we see them? How do we address them? What do we do? Well, first, let's think about what are noble causes. What are our core values? The university has core values. My core value to you is making sure you're a success, becoming your mentor, not just your professor, but your friend. Someone you can call and say, hey, I know this is outside the scope of the course, Dr. Spangler, but I have an issue. I have a problem. I found a friend who has a problem, and I want to help solve it. Can you help me? How do we do this? This is creating core values. The college has a list of core values. Integrity, right? Our value to you is instilling academic excellence and integrity, becoming a world value, and a community leader. Most people don't think that the university cares this much, but we do. One of our values is you. You reflect on us. We have to consider, are you more than just a student that crosses across the plank. Are you the one with an A? Yes. There's plenty of A students, but are you the students we really want out there representing MGU? Are we the ones that are going to be able to say, you are our Bill Gates. You are our uh, president. You are the one who added core values. You became a scout leader. You became a church leader. You became the person who changed the way sidewalks are in Cochrane and making sure they're handicapped accessible. You're the one who brought noble causes to the front above yourself and your community and your organization and brought everyone in power together. These are core values. We learn them as children from our family, from our churches, from our groups that we're engaged with. I was a scout. I learned plenty of core values from scouting. I know I need to help an elderly person across the street. I know that I need to help a person who can't reach that bottle of dressing on the top shelf. Reach it. Simple human core values. Caring about others. Externalizing my care. Going that extra mile. Yes, we are thinking about outcomes for this course. Are our assets sufficient for our outcomes? Do we have enough education right now? Did I learn enough in my coding? Do I need to go back and review some of those elementary things in HTML? Do I need to go back and embrace some of the failures I have and overcome them and go talk to one of the other professors and say, look, I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe you go talk to the dean and say, you know, I know you're not in the classrooms all the time, but I hear so much about you. Can you share some of your knowledge with me? I just didn't learn enough here, or I didn't get this. Or do you have a book on your shelf I can borrow? Can you come lecture to our class? We'd love to hear your point of view. Or how did you get this far? Are your assets sufficient for the outcomes for your group? If you know you have a weakness in this analysis, how do you overcome it? How do you embrace it and say, I am stronger than this. I am better than this. I can do this. Failure is awesome. Why is failure awesome? Because it's a way for you to learn. It's a way for you to create an opportunity 
in that SWOT analysis and say, I failed this test miserably and say, I didn't study enough. I didn't review my notes. I need to start doing this weekly. I need to put on my personal Google calendar that every Monday I review my notes for Dr. Spangler's class. Or I know that every Wednesday I need to update my value added in my SWOT analysis for his course. So it's simple. It's a copy paste and you're done for the semester. I know that I need to go back and take another course, or I should review that course. I should go talk to a professor that I loved and say, hey, what do you think for me? Where should I go from here? These are behaviors. And when you change your mental cognitive perspective on your own behaviors, you will be accomplished. You will be awesome. You will go to that next stage and you will become a mentor yourself. And people will see this and gravitate around you. Are your assets enough to support your behavior now? If you're arrogant and flaunting it, do you really know enough? I'm betting you don't. Every day I learn. I read a book every day. Every room in my house has a different book with a different topic and a different subject. I do this to empower myself. I don't know a lot about X, so when I say I don't know a lot about X, I buy a book and I read it. I don't have to read it straight through, but I read page by page. I walk in that room, my goal is to read two or three pages and say, huh, I learned something. I add to my value. My behavior I changed. As a youth, all I wanted to do was play hockey. Hmm, not going to get me far in life, right? So I changed my output. I changed the frame of mind and how I thought about it by empowering myself to saying, I need to be greater. And I did this through books. In my car, there's always a book. In my library, there's a book, of course. In my office, there's many. On my desk, on my bed, everywhere I go, a book. Just so I read one page. What's one page? Nothing. Kind of weird, kind of different. But it's really brought me to a new level. And it supports my behaviors and how I want to empower myself and be greater. One, it helped me become a teacher to you. So let's look a little more. One of the greatest lessons I learned was learning about tacit knowledge. There's two different types of knowledge. There's tacit knowledge and there's explicit knowledge. We know what explicit knowledge is. You're getting explicit knowledge right now from this lecture. You've gotten explicit knowledge from your interactive design textbook when you had that HCI interaction course. And you're going to pull that information into this course for your reports. Yes, you're going to go back to that textbook and you're going to reread chapter one. You're going to reread the possibilities of how you thought about what is the interaction design elements that I need. Are they consistent? Am I looking over the different ideas of problem spaces? Am I thinking about how I should actually have a cognitive representation? Should I be in the environment for a user task analysis? You're going to look for identifying the participants that are the best to be in your user task analysis. You're going to think about the functionality. Is this a haptic interface? Is this something that we really need to think about differently? You know these explicit skills and you can go back to that books. But you also have tacit knowledge. So I'm going to tell you a story. When I was a child, my grandfather raised me and he would take me fly fishing. And we'd walk through this train tunnel and over across this high trestle. And we could see the river below about 100, 200 feet. I was always scared. And my grandfather would insist on stopping in the middle of this train trestle and looking at the river. He'd look at how it meandered left and right and left and right. He'd hold his hand high above his head and see where the shadow falls. And when we got close, he would do the shadow thing again and he would on purpose stop. And he would make sure the sun's always on his face. Why? Because the shadow would cast behind him. He knew that if he walked up to the stream and the shadow hit the water before he got to it, the fish would know he was coming. And he would creep low and slow. And he would walk in particularly up first and look, then walk back. And then he would take out his little tackle box and he would take a hook and some string and he would tie different types of colors of feathers on it. He was matching what he saw with the bugs because he knew the bugs were what the fish was eating. Then he would walk to the area of the stream 
where he saw it had the ripples, where the water met the calm, and oxygen would twirl underneath there the most, and he would gently lay his line out in that water. And I'll be danged if he didn't catch a trout right away. I would throw things in trees, I would run around, and I would never catch a fish. And every time we went, he never told me anything. I watched him. I learned through tacit knowledge what to do. I started raising my hand up, looking for my shadow, making sure my sun was on me, the sun was on my face. I learned to watch what bugs were coming up out of the water and make my selection of flies tied to them. And I learned to know where to lay that line, gently and quietly, so they didn't think it was artificial. This is tacit knowledge. Every one of you has tacit knowledge skills that you've been learning. Watching your peers code somehow faster. Watching them think about things differently. Their study habits. The way they go to the gym and exercise when they get stressed to take down that area of mental cognitive problems. You learn tacit knowledge every day. You learn from your parents. You learn from your friends, church leaders, community leaders. You learn not to touch a hot plate as a child by watching others gently work around it. Or you got burned. These are tacit knowledge skills. A couple of the people that I know you love too, Jobs, of course, with Apple, his core values was always about building technology but empowering others. It wasn't about that plastic box and the wires that they were building in the garage. It was about empowering. He saw how only limited amount of people had access to these incredible supercomputers. And he said, why can't everybody have it? He created a model. He took that model and added core values. And he added values that said, we always got to be better. We're never good enough. We always got to make sure our clients, our customers are satisfied beyond. Another person I'm going to talk about is Raymond Shea. He's the CEO of Zappos. And he saw in his first company, which he sold for millions, a software company, that he hated working there. He knew that the people were miserable because of relationships and their externalization was problematic. He knew that it wasn't in line for his ownership and he left. But he went to Zappos, a place where he created an entire culture. And his culture is very different. It's a culture of extending and empowering people through relationships. And that's what you're going to need to do in this class as well. You're going to need to externalize the information and what you do. And you're going to need to empower somebody else and build relationships. I want you to work with places that need help. Specifically nonprofits I would like you to see you work with. I want you to go into Goodwill and build an IS system so that they know that they're lacking in donations on children's shoes from sizes 6 to 8, or that they need women's sweatshirts because the weather's turning cold here. And a quick click of the button might be the one that helps them, and they can say, man, those kids really empowered us and helped us. we got to see if they can work for our friend who's building a company. Oh, wait, you just got a client. Building relationships, externalizing your value added, and helping others. This is one of the core things you're going to learn here today, too. So how do we think about a lot of this? Well, there's five stages in leadership models that I want you to think about. And interpersonally, we're going to think about this. The first stage, and you're going to see this person right away. They call it the despairing hostility. Life sucks. I'm not going to hear many professors say that, but I'm going to talk about it. They're the negative Nancys. And you're going to have a negative Nancy in your group, and you're going to want to just go crazy. But you're going to have to work around or eventually think about how do we empower this negative Nancy to get them to be on the team, to be part of us, to be more, to add value, not just to us, but to our external clients and to empower others. Because these people are sick in a way. Because they are stuck in this rut to where they think everything here sucks. The college sucks, the food sucks, the grass sucks, my bicycle sucks, the world sucks, my textbook sucks. Dr. Spangler sucks, of course. He knows nothing. 
You have these negative Nancys. They're stage two, though, because eventually your group's going to get stronger. And these individuals, which it might be you, and you're thinking right now, oh, man, that is kind of me. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to move into the second stage if it's you. And you're going to start thinking, well, yeah, my, my, my life does kind of suck because I have such a poor attitude. I'm overweight. I don't go to the gym. My car's constantly breaking down because I don't spend time maintaining it. My house is filthy, so none of my friends come over. I can't get a girl or a guy. Uh, you know, my pencil stinks. Maybe I should uh, get a new one. My computer's never updated, so it's never running functionally. Yeah, I kind of suck. Everybody else is going fast. They're all getting A's because, well, I'm not studying enough. I didn't create a Google Calendar and set alarms up for myself two days before to study for the test. So I'm always getting a B. I'm always getting a C. But I see that Dr. Spangler always has this. He has his whole semester mapped out on a calendar. So he knows a week before when something's due that he should be studying for the test or he should have his SWOT analysis almost done. He should constantly be revising and going back over his notes. He's got goofy alarms to go back over his textbook that he got 25 years ago. This is empowering yourself. These are tips you can tell your friends and your peers outside of this class and add value already to yourself and externalize our information and our learning, becoming a mentor. Are you a mentor to a freshman student coming in? No? Why not? You're the best value here. You already have knowledge and tacit knowledge and experience. I watched a student the other day and his mother try to learn how to put money on their card. I didn't know how to do it. So you know what the first thing I did was? As I went in and I said, who here is a senior student? And I had about 10 hands shoot up. I said, I want you to empower me, to mentor me. And they all looked like I was crazy. And I had three of them walk out. They walked us through how to do this. And they became friends with that student in a minute. And the mom just looked at me and said, what did you do? I said, I empowered somebody. Now that boy is already part of their group. And he was learning how to go through the line. They were talking about tips to go here, go there. And the mom looked at me and said, thank you. I said, no, thank you. She said, why am I thanking you? I said, you empowered me to learn something new and help somebody else. That's pretty cool. This is where you need to start thinking. If you're saying, my car sucks, my house sucks, what are you going to do to change it? Are you going to learn how to go to the gym and say, hey, you're really muscular. Don't take this offensive, but I really want to learn what you're doing. Or, I don't know how to use this. Can you help me read this? Or, I don't know how to code this. Can you just talk to me? I know you know you're awesome at this. As soon as you tell somebody, empower somebody, they're awesome, they're great, and you want to learn from them, if they don't turn back and say, yeah, sure, let me get on that, let me help you, let me tell you, or let me find somebody who can help you, then that person is a lagger, and they need to be removed from your life. <laughs> you have friends that are laggers, and they're probably this person we're talking about right now, because right now they're back in their dorm, they're skipping class, and they're watching YouTube videos, right? Not productive ones, goofy ones, or they're playing video games. They're not adding value to you. Those are the people you leave behind, the laggers. You'll learn to do that. In the groups, we got to learn how to empower people because otherwise your group gets pulled down. This lone warrior comes out of it when you start getting that feeling. Maybe they got the first A and they see everybody else getting Bs. They're like, I'm great, you suck. Whoa. Is that cool? No. It's great you got an A and you're changing your mentality. You know, and you start looking at people like, I'm the reason why you're here. No. But if you're the reason you're empowering others, awesome. I can go farther. I can go faster on an elliptical machine than you. We've all been to the gym and seen this guy. He's going 500 miles an hour and sweat pouring off him. He's looking over at everybody who's doing the job and are happy, but he can't go fast enough. He's trying to defeat himself to make you think that he's greater than you. He's full of himself. Or they're the name droppers. Hey, I was out with Sally the other night, and we ran into Dr. Spangler, you know, and he had along uh, Dr. Koo hanging a few other people. And we were talking about my dad's good friend, you know, Bill Gates. 
right? We all know this person. Get over it. How do you help somebody? When you know Bill Gates and you can say, you know what? We have a coding issue. We have a problem here. I wonder if I can talk to my dad to ask him to, to get Bill Gates to help us. That's when you're something awesome. That's when you start thinking about community. Yourself is only a person, but you're empowering others. And your team's going to need to do this so that you get to this fourth stage and become awesome. We're great. We're the number one team. You're looking at all the other teams, and they're all looking at you like, oh, man, why can't I be on that team? You overcome conflicts. You easily find resolutions. You start thinking about it and brainstorming. And you meet virtually every week, and, and you say, here's the problem I have. How do we all think about this and get over it? You become greater than you. You start empowering each other, and that empowerment influences eventually the other groups. But it's not the best thing you can be. The last stage is the best. You're in wonderment. Life is great. We are great. Our class is great. But even more so, since we're helping so many groups out there with IS solutions, we're creating a solution for them. We're empowering them. And they're externally saying to other people about how great these students did in Dr. Spangler's class. And you guys should talk to them about working for you. Oh my God, you have clients then. That's how it works, gang. You empower others through your knowledge and help them. They, in turn, pass it along. They, in turn, share. Macintosh was all about empowering others. Yes, they were a stakeholder in the empowerment. They externalized their knowledge, same as you can do. You build a community and you grow it. And you do that through helping and motivating others with your wisdom and knowledge that you're gaining and you already have gained. And then you reapply it to yourselves by saying in your analysis, how do I do more? What opportunities can I make? What are my strengths now? What are my weaknesses now? What opportunities? And are there any threats that I need to overcome? Do we still have a lagger in our group that unfortunately we fired? Because it just wouldn't get on the team. Couldn't get over their own personal problems. They couldn't find a value at it. This is when people in the IS field lose their jobs. And I've seen many of people do this, unfortunately. And it's very sad because they're probably, in most cases, the most talented. But they couldn't get over their internal problems. They couldn't learn to add value to themselves or value to a team and externalize it. And they're left behind. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the misfits, the rebels, the rebels, the troublemakers, the troublemakers, the round pegs, the round the pegs holes. and the square holes. The ones who see, the ones things, who differently. see things differently. They're not fond of rules, They're not fond and, of they rules no and they have the no respect quo. for the status quo. You can quote them, you can disagree, quote them, with, them disagree with them, glorify or vilify, glorify or vilify them. them. About the only thing you, can't, the only do thing you can't do is ignore them because they change because things. They, change things. They, push the they push the human race forward. While some may see them, as, some the may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. We see genius. Because the people who are because crazy, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who, are the ones do. who do. That's a pretty powerful clip. And every time when I get down on myself, I watch that and think about it. How do I make changes? How do I do differently? How do I add value to my community? Can I just sit at dinner like I did last night and talk to a freshman student who wants to be a journalist and say, here's where your career path's going to go. I did it for 25 years. Here's how I changed my life to get into CIS and information science field because I was so interested as a child with it. Enamored by my Apple, my Apple IIc. My grandmother still uses it, by the way, to write me a letter. She prints it out and mails it, but we still have my original Macintosh and my Apple IIc that came out second. Pretty cool. I've always loved this stuff. I want you to listen to just a little bit of this, and it's odd. This is the Stanford speech. And I want you to think about not the negative Nancy talk he is about 
education, but I want you to think about his message here. And think about how he went outside of the box. And that's why I'm going to play this. So let's take two seconds. And I'm going to set this up for you. And just listen to the speech for a minute. If you have any Thank you. I'm, uh, honored, I'm uh, to today, honored to be with you today for your commencement from one of the finest in universities in the world. Truth be told, Truth be told uh, I, never graduated, uh, I never graduated from college, and, uh, and uh, this is the closest, this I've, is the ever closest I've, I've ever gotten to a college graduation. <laughs> today, I want today, to tell you three stories, three stories from my That's life. It. No That's deal. it. No big just deal. Three just three stories. The first story, the first story is, about connecting the dots. is about connecting the dots. I dropped out of Reed College, I dropped out of Reed after, college the months, after the first six months, but then stayed around as a drop-in drop 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 for another 18 so months or so quit. before I really quit. So why'd I drop out? So why'd I drop out? It started before I was it born. Started before I was born. My biological, mother My biological mother was a young, unwed, was a young, graduate, unwed student, graduate student, and she decided, to put, and she decided to put me up for adoption. She felt very strongly, she felt that, very I strongly that I should be adopted by college graduates, so everything was all set, so everything was all for, set me for me to be adopted at birth by a lawyer and his wife. Except that when I popped Except out, I popped they decided at the last they minute, that, the they last really minute that they really wanted a girl. So my parents, so my parents list, who were on a waiting got list, a got a call in the middle asking, of the night asking, we've got an unexpected, we've got baby, an unexpected boy. baby boy, do you want him? They said, they said of course. My biological mother my biological found out later, found that, out my later that my mother had never college, graduated from college and that my father had never, graduated, father had from never graduated from high school. She refused to sign, she refused the, final to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a she few, only months, relented later a few months later when my parents that promised I that I would go to college. This was the start, this was the start in my life. And 17 years later, and 17 years I, later did I did go to college. But I naively chose but a college, I naively chose that, was a college as that was almost as expensive as Stanford. And all of my working, and class, of my parents working savings class parents' savings were being spent tuition. on my college tuition. After six months, After six I, couldn't months couldn't I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I, I, wanted, no to idea what I wanted to do with my and life, no idea how and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was, spending all the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I, decided to drop so I decided to drop out and trust that it would all, work, trust out it would okay. all work out okay. It was pretty scary at the, it was time, pretty scary at the back, time, but looking it back, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. The minute I dropped out, the minute I, dropped out I could stop taking, I could the, required stop taking the required that classes that didn't interest me and begin, and begin dropping in on the ones that, looked far, that looked far more interesting. It wasn't all romantic. It wasn't all romantic. I didn't have a dorm room, I didn't have so, a dorm I room so I slept on the floor rooms. in friends' rooms. I returned coat bottles, I returned for, coat five bottles for the five-cent deposits to buy food with. And I would walk the seven, miles, walk across the seven miles across Sunday town every Sunday night to get one good meal a to get one good meal Hare Hare week Krishna at the Hare Krishna temple. I loved it. I loved it. And much of what I stumbled and much into, of what I stumbled by, into following by following my curiosity and intuition turned out to be priceless later on. Let me give you one example. Reed College at that Reed time, College offered, at that perhaps time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. In the country. Throughout, the campus, Throughout the campus, every poster, every, every, poster, label, on every, every label on every drawer was beautifully, was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out, because I had and, dropped didn't out and didn't have classes, to take the normal classes, I decided to take a calligraphy, to class, to take a calligraphy to class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, it was beautiful historical, historical, artistically subtle, artistically in, a subtle in a way that capture. science can't capture. And I found it fascinating. And I found it fascinating. None of this had, None even, of this a had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, but 10 years when, later when we were designing the first Macintosh, computer, first Macintosh computer, it all came back to, it all came back and to me. It and we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped, I had in, never on dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had, multiple, have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. And since Windows just, copied, since the Windows Mac, just copied the Mac, it's likely that no, likely that no personal computer would have them. Never 
dropped if out. I had never dropped out, out, I would have, never, would have never dropped in on that calligraphy and class, and personal computers, might not, computers have might not have the wonderful typography that they do. Of course, it was, of course, impossible, it was to impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards ten years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. Because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path. And that will make all the difference. My second story, My second story is, about love. is about love. So why did I show you this video? Do I want you to drop out of college? No. Is that the mission? Is that the, the message that he's saying? No, he's saying about something more. He's saying about empowering yourself, overcoming, adapting, and learning. Constantly learning. I encourage all of my students to take art courses. Why? Well, one, I was a photographer for years, and I loved it. And that photography taught me so many different things about visualization and visual information, especially about how to share it and what to do and what is good and what is bad and what is distracting. It also taught me things about life, about behavior. My graphics degree, the first degree, taught me about visualization for building things like interfaces, web design color, culture, cognitive representations that we don't think about, causing the eye to move instead of stop, leading a person to where we need them to go, cultural representations that cause conflict, which you'll have to think about in your designs. His was a calligraphy class, and it became a mainstay for everything we see today with interfaces. Think about how the haptic design started. Think about these challenges and where they came from. It wasn't from just sitting with the ordinary. It was from taking something from something else and adapting it and overcoming. Steve Krug has this great book called Don't Make Me Think. It's about sensible processes and usability in websites. And he thinks about ways that you can look at them differently and examining things. I encourage everybody to look at that. I gave you a copy of the your uh, ISBN for the books. It's cheap little books. You should look at them. And think about some of the methodologies that he thinks about and how to change and reframe something and adapt or look at, you know, and format. It's a little bit different, but it's fun too. So let's move a little forward. Oh. The stages of managerialism. These are things I know you never talked about. I know that they're going to be difficult. and You're going to include these in your report. That's right, gang. You're going to have to talk about these stages, where you are, what type of organization you are, what management style did you do in your teamwork. It's not just about building a structural product anymore. You can do this. You can do it well. It's now about how do you become effective leaders and managers in projects? How do you externalize and add value to not only this community of practice we're in, our classroom, your group, but our college, our university, and our community? That's what I'm looking to see out of my A students. So let's talk about the different frames. Bullman and Dills discusses this. A structural frame is one of the most common they are the machine. We're used to this. Code X equals Y, get to the Z, right? We have concepts. We have rules. We're used to rules. We like them because they get us to our goal. If it doesn't work, there's a conflict. We have to solve it, resolve it, and move forward. We have social atmospheres to where we all work together for a common goal. We're in tune on the task. And let's think about Ford. When Ford first started the Model T, he came up with the innovative idea of what? Ah, you don't know? Well, let's talk about it. He came up with the idea of the productivity line, just like we do with coding. Maybe one person's writing this, one person's writing that. You put it together, it works great. That's what he did. He created a production line. 
you put the tires on, I put the windshield in, I put the hood on, I paint. Well, when problems happen, he had to resolve them. And one of them was the metal. You think, okay, what's this have to do with IS systems? Well, let's think about this. It's an information system. Everybody has to have their cog, their part in the wheel to get it to turn. So if the metal people weren't able to bend the metal fast enough to get it through, to get it through processing, Ford had to think, well, what can I do? Well, he thought, well, this is what we do. We make cars. We don't make metal. And then he reframed his idea and says, well, why can't we learn how to make metal? Why can't we make a code that's going to fit what we need? Why do we have to use their frame? So he made metal. He opened up a steel mill, made stronger, flexible steel that the car engineer steel models themselves after, and put it to work so that now his guys were able to bend and machine the metal faster and spit out more Model Ts. And they were happier because they weren't having such problems. They weren't so frustrated. So they thought outside the box. He hired people that were great steel workers to work for him. And he made his own steel mill just for him, just for their plan to fix a problem, to stop frustration in his car building. Rather interesting. The structural frame. The human resources frame is the most common we're used to. We won't really have this. But it's the frame to where everything is organized in a family essence. The community is run as a machine, sort of, to where everybody's empowered by human resources. You get your benefits there. You understand your job rule there. You don't go outside of your job rule, kind of a union shop idea. You learn that you only do this, you only code, you don't worry about safety, you don't worry about security, you don't worry about any of the other aspects in the IT programming world. You just worry about your job because human resources says you do this. You don't worry about governance policies and whether or not everyone else in the organization is following governance to make sure that somebody doesn't leave their computer on when they go to the bathroom and unsecure. Or that they don't give away passwords. Your job's to code. This is a human resources frame. And you guys might start out this way in actuality to where you pick a role and say this is it. But you're going to understand to become a really good community of practice you're going to have to teach each other and share your information to overcome conflicts and get outside of this and empower each other as your own in, internal leaders. And eventually, and I hope to see it, you're going to empower other teams and help them. And you're going to empower the organization you work for. And hopefully you get further than this class and you empower more. The political frame is a jungle. It's chaos a lot of times. Everybody's fighting for power. And you've worked with people like this, correct? They're the problem children. They are better. They know more. They cause the conflict. They're on constant competition with you. Who's in power? Who's going to say what? Well, when you have this, nobody moves forward. You start having a big problem. We've seen political frames where they cause huge global problems in history. Look at Hitler. Persuasive, powerful, but he caused conflict and competition within inside his own people to be more empowered towards him and eventually caused a greater essence in the world where England and the United States and France, everybody became more than them and empowered each other to help stop the conflict. It's an extreme case that I'm talking about in the jungle, but it happens every day. It's the political frame. We see this in local politics. If you go to one of your sewer boards and you sit and watch, you'll see the political frame at work. Even in the most minute essence, you may run into this. And if this is, you guys are going to have to work as a team to figure out that challenge and say, look, here's our agenda. How do we get through this? How can we be advocates for somebody else, move ourselves ahead, and not have internal fight? Because if you have internal fight, and not a deadline-based project where everybody's working as a team and virtually meeting every week to get through this stuff and work and empower each other, you're going to start having huge issues. You're going to be failures. Failure is not bad. Failure is great because we can learn from it. 
embrace it. If you don't know what you're doing in this area, it is cool. It is good to ask for help. It is empowering to ask one of your professors you had that you liked before to walk in their office and say to them, I really enjoyed your class. I've always been motivated by you. My team's having a little bit of a struggle here, and I know that you taught us this. Can you re-go over this? I was reading my notes and looking at my book, and I'm just not seeing it. Can you empower us? That professor's going to jump. Or maybe you go to your pastor and you ask your pastor, how do I get past a conflict with this person? How do I empower them? How do I challenge them to be more in my group? Or this team really is just knocking on our door, making fun of us or what? How do we do that? You talk about it. You embrace things and you move forward. You're going to have this. The last is a symbolic frame. These are our pastors, the Pope, the people that are inspirational leaders. Apple. I mean, think about it. You know, it was all about inspirational leading. The company actually fired him. Yes, they fired him. But then they brought him back when they went to this human resources frame and saw how miserable people were. And their great coders, their great innovative people were leaving because they were so miserable. And when they brought back their leader... That symbolic frame changed. Everybody wanted to be innovative. Everybody wanted to go for it, go to that next level, and become an empowerment again. It's about culture and meaning. You had rituals. Zappos had such rituals. You want to throw a balloon party? Go ahead. You want to come in and do a yoga class? Go for it. You want to be in a clown suit? Go for it. Their leadership is inspirational. He says, I don't want a paycheck. I don't need a paycheck. Give it to my employees. My goal is to be better, to make people happy. The person who buys our shoes are going to be happier. The leaders need things, right? You're going to have to have a team leader, pretty much, but you can rotate it, or you can keep it the same. The person has to have the vision. Where do we need to be to keep on track? How do we use technology to do this and innovations and share? Do we start Google Docs, Google Calendar, Google Share to keep us all online? They have to have the strength mentally to say, I know this, how to use this. Let me lead this part of the team. Let me be the organizer. Let me be the one who makes sure that we virtually meet, get everybody information. They have to have the commitment as well in their part. Maybe it's the coding. Maybe one of you is just a coding commitment leader. And you say, I'm going to make sure we're on track, or I'm going to be the one who checks and does quality assurance. They can be a situational. They're going to be the one who externalizes. And maybe every time you meet, you share with somebody else what you've learned on the other groups that are having problems. And say, hey, if anybody needs help, you can help us. We'll help you. I'm not objected to that. I think that's awesome. Look at some of the greatest leaders. JFK, Obama. Everybody says about Obama, yes, no, good, bad. Every leader has great qualities. It comes from a vision they have. Obama's, of course, is health care. JFK's had a whole different vision about education and leadership there. Patton was about making sure the mission was done and our men come home safe. Colin Powell was a great leader and still is a great leader. And he has this idea about whether or not to make a decision. And he says that 60% of everything is your gut. When you have 40% of knowledge, you have to make a decision and go for it. And that go for it should be for the best interests of everyone and not you. Shay's idea is about empowering everyone on his team and not just that, but making sure everybody is happy with every pair of shoes they get. And if someone calls in and doesn't have a size 12 shoe, like I do, and they say, I'm sorry, Scott, we don't have this. Every employee's job is to say, but let me find you those shoes somewhere else to make sure you're happy. Why? Because I tell other people about it. I just told all of you. That was cool. And I went back and bought a pair of shoes later. Not only that, he told me, well, we're sending you the shoes. You'll be there three, four days. The next day, I had my shoes at the doorstep. Every single person that purchased, they reward, they thank, by overnighting the shoes to them. And they stick inside there a sticker that says, for the next year, if you're not happy with the shoes, send them back. 
We'll take them. Here's a sticker free of charge. They want you to empower others to come to them to get better quality shoes and better clients. Interesting. Cotter talks about these models in uh, Bowman and Deal's books too. You know, in structural, he says they're more about direction and clarity and getting around barriers, communication, the core to make sure you solve it. The human resources is about uncertainty and anxiety. And these are all things you might be thinking about putting in your reports. We kind of use human resources. We went to an exterior person. We went to Dr. Spangler and said, hey, we're having a lot of anxiety and uncertainty about our this. What do we do? And I recommend, well, let's do training. Let's go back. Let's revise. Let's go find someone who can help us. The political frame. You're going to have this. And you're going to have to get around barriers for this. And you might disempower a person and say, hey, look, everybody's got to be equal here. We need to all work together. You have to negotiate and say, look, I know you like to do coding. That's all you want to do. But we really need somebody else there on the team to do and lead and talk to the client. And I know you're not the best public speaker, but I think you can do it because you could talk the best about what we're doing. And then you have a symbolic. You know, he's going to be the one who's going to have the rituals of your team. It's going to say, look, every time we get past this part, we're going and having pizza. We're all getting together in my dorm and we're celebrating this quarterly review and our SWOT reviews and our report is done. And we manage the tasks and resolutions that were brought back to us. We're celebrating every quarter. And I want you to do that. I want you to listen to this one little piece just for a minute. It's a really quiet video. But listen to what this man's saying about Tesla, his creation, his baby. It's a little bit different. Uh, for some odd reason, it's. Um, let's see if I can start it. It's really quiet. Some of them are going um, like, to sound like, like, well, you've heard it before, but you're uh, worth reemphasizing. Yeah, I think the first uh, is uh, you need to work, depending on how well you, depending depending well you, well you want to do, and particularly if you're starting a company, you need to work super hard. So what, what does super so hard mean? Well, when my brother and I were starting our first company, instead of getting an apartment, we just rented a small office and we slept on the couch. And we showered at the YMCA. Uh, and we're so, uh, we're, we're so hot up, we had computer, just so one computer. So the, 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 website, the, was the days, website was up during uh, the day, and I was coding at uh, night. Seven days a week, seven days time. week all the time. Um, and I, um, I, uh, and I, I uh, sort of briefly had a girlfriend, sort of briefly had a girlfriend in that period. period. And in order to be with me, she had to sleep in the office. In the office. So, so I, uh, work hard, like, work hard, like in, 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 every waking hour. I mean, every that's, waking that's hour. The that's thing that's the, the thing I would I would so say, if, if you, particularly if you're starting a company. Um, and I mean, if you do simple and, maths, I mean, you're like, do simple if, maths, you're like work, okay, if somebody else is working 50 hours, 50 hours and you're working uh, 100, you'll get twice uh, as done, twice as much done in the course of a year as the other company. The other thing I'd say is that if you're creating a company or if you're joining a company, the most important thing is to uh, is, to attract, great is to attract great people. people. So either be with, join a group that's amazing that you really respect, or if, you, if you're building a company, you've got to gather great people. I mean, all a company is is a group of people that have gathered together to create a product or service. And so, depending upon how talented and hardworking that group is, and the degree to which they are focused uh, cohesively in, in a good direction, that will determine the success of the company. So, do everything you can to to gather great people. Uh, if, if you're creating a company, um, um, I'd then I'd say focus on on signal over noise. Over noise. Um, um, a lot of companies get get they confused. They they, they spend money on things that don't actually, make, actually the make the product better. So, so for example, for example at, Tesla, at at Tesla, we've, we've never spent, we've, we've any, never money spent any money on advertising. Um, um, we put, we, all, we the put all of the money R into R and D and, and manufacturing and design to try to make the car as good as possible. Um, and uh, and uh, I think that's that's, that's, the, way to go. That, that's so the way to go. So, for any given company, for, for any given company just, just keep thinking can, can about, keep thinking about are these efforts that are these people efforts are, that are expending, people are, are expending, are they resulting better in a service? better product or service? Not, and if they're not, efforts. stop those efforts. Um, and then the, um, the, 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 the final thing is, final thing is, is sort of 
is to sort of don't just follow the trend. So you may have heard me say that it's good to think in terms of the physics approach, the first principles, which is rather than reasoning by analogy, you boil things down to the most fundamental truths you can imagine, and you reason up from there. And this is a good way to figure out if. Really if, if something makes really sense, makes sense, or if it's just what everybody else is doing. What everybody else is doing. Um, um, it, it's, hard it, it's, it's hard to think that way. You can't think, think, think that way about it everything. It takes a lot of effort. Um, but uh, if, you're but if you're trying to do something new, think. it's the best way to um, think. And that framework was, um, developed, that framework was by, developed by physicists, by, by physicists to, to figure out counterintuitive things, like quantum mechanics. So it's really a powerful, powerful method. Um, so, gang, this is a little bit different thinking. It's about empowering. Here's a man who created Tesla. He's also creating a second company right now that's household solar panel production. And he's looking at the aspect of how he can adapt his car battery into houses to empower other people to get off the grid and stop wasting fossil fuels. Him and his cousin are working together to create a secondary customer client base not just so they have more sales, but the idea of empowering the world. We can get off fossil fuels, we're going to use solar power because everywhere has sunlight, and we can use this and store it in household size refrigerator batteries that can power our whole house. That's why I brought him into this. He makes cars, electric cars, fantastic cars, very expensive cars, but his innovation and ideas is always about what can I do to empower more? How can I take what I have, adapt, overcome, and become something greater? How can I be a mentor? How can I change a business model? These leadership aspects we're talking about are learning skills for you right now, and you're going to face inside of your productions this semester, and you're going to learn curves. And you can use these pieces, and I want them all in your productions to think about them. What stage are you? Are you a structural frame? Are you in a human resources frame? Where am I in my SWOT report? You should be saying, what stage am I in my, in my capabilities right now? Am I stuck in stage three? Think about these things. I want you to think about how you empower each other and other groups and other people and other classmates. I challenge you today to become a mentor for a freshman student. I challenge you to become more than just a mentor for that person, but somebody else, and pass it along. Use your skills and knowledge, and let's empower each other. I'm looking forward to an awesome semester, everyone. See you soon.